Thank you folks for joining us and welcome to Grace. As we uh, continue our journey through the Bible, we are now in that portion of Scripture where God, having placed his national program with Israel uh, under the law contract aside for a time, began to complete a work with all nations alike and totally apart from the law of Moses. As uh, the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 4, uh, listen to his words here, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So when you believe that uh, what Christ had done in that point in time, there's no need for uh, thinking you could achieve your, your uh, righteousness through your performance. While the economy of the law was in place, God dealt with the nation Israel in accordance with the law contract that he placed them under at Mount Sinai. And of course, uh, God's desire was that the people of his nation make their confession that they failed to do as their forefathers had sworn that they were capable of doing. That's what 1 John 1, 9, that's what that passage is all about. In order that Israel become a peculiar treasure unto himself, uh, a nation above all nations, they had to make the law failure confession that God required in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 42. And as you will uh, recall, the religious uh, slash political leadership of Israel, namely the priesthood in that day, had been given their final opportunity uh, to make the nation's law failure confession in order that Israel might acquire that status of being a, a nation above all nations, a holy nation, a peculiar treasure unto himself, and a, a kingdom of priests as they were promised. However, rather than making the confession that uh, they as a nation had failed the contract, uh, that their forefathers had sworn them capable of fulfilling, along with the fact that their forefathers had also failed that contract. They had, to, they had to confess that the whole nation failed it. The religious leaders of the nation directed that Stephen be stoned to death at Paul's uh, vote after Stephen had soundly delivered the indictment as to the nation's worthiness of being the recipients of God's wrath. Therefore, Israel stood in prime position for the entrance of the time of Jacob's trouble, otherwise known as the tribulation period. They were right ready for that. But what did God do? Instead of initiating the final seven years, sitting in Israel's fifth and final bucket of wrath, God set his national program with Israel on the shelf for a time, uh, for a time undisclosed. And he chose his son's most adamant human opponent. That would have been Saul of Tarsus to inaugurate the new economy, that's economia, meaning dispensation, that God would be ushering in through Paul. So I'm sure you're familiar with Paul's words in Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 13, where he stated the purpose for which God had called him in the first place. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, not one of, but the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Uh, since God was no longer dealing uh, with a single nation, but with all people alike, and totally apart from the law of Moses, how would the economy of grace impact the Jewish law-loving religious crowd who had known the law of Moses like the back of their hands, but had not yet come to believe in Christ as their Messiah. Well, keep in mind, these were the folks that Paul was trying to reach as he always began in every area he journeyed with a visit to the Jewish synagogue in an effort to, uh, to reach his kinsmen after the flesh with the message he had now come to believe himself, uh, the gospel of God. The unbelieving Jews in the synagogues were the religious crowd that had been brought up, as we said, under the letter of the law and their consciences had been programmed uh, accordingly. The fact that they were religious Jews is evident in the fact that Paul found them in the synagogues. <laughs> they were the law-loving Jews, we might call them, of Paul's time. What's more, the more religiously oriented they were, the more they failed to see their failure, and the more they supposed their performance to be the criteria by which they could make themselves uh, acceptable before God. Like the scribes and the Pharisees, the law-loving leaders of that day, uh, the children of Israel were guilty. They were guilty of assuming that they could earn their righteous standing before God Almighty by way of their adherence to the law of Moses, a law by which no man could attain a perfect score. Uh, save the God-man himself, Jesus Christ. Notice 
Paul's statement in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 3. There our apostles said, for they, speaking of the people of Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness, a righteousness that came by faith only, they knew nothing about righteousness being imputed apart from behavior, and going about to establish their own righteousness, and they were doing it through their supposed law keeping, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So why did Paul always go to the Jews first, now that a new dispensation was in place? Why not just skip over the Jews? Their answer is because he loved them. Not only were they Jews that had not heard because they were outside of Jerusalem, having been scattered, he loved them. They were his kinsmen after the flesh. Uh, Paul himself was Jewish, and Paul had been well aware of what God had promised the nation. He said he would make of Abram and the future that God had in store for them. And so as Paul began the dispensational section of Romans, that would be chapters 9 through 11, he spoke of his love for the Jewish people. The first five verses of chapter 9 reveal Paul's heart for those with whom he had an ancestral relationship. Listen to Paul reveal his innermost feelings for his own people. And he does so in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Here Paul said, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ uh, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul loved the Jewish people. He was Jewish himself. So in verses 4 and 5 of Romans 9, he went on, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, the promises of a land, we might say, and a kingdom, and a king whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. So Paul's telling us Christ came because of those Jews. Did you notice the final portion of verse 5, where speaking of Israel, Paul said, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came? This is something that a, a lot of folks, I believe, miss when it comes to the earthly ministry of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so concerning humankind, the focus of Christ's earthly ministry was the Israelites. This is why Christ said of himself in Matthew chapter 15, uh, verse 24, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notice no mention of Gentiles there at all. The one who had come to introduce Christ to the nation, Israel, was none other than John the Baptist, who echoed Christ's statement uh, with a statement of his own. In John chapter 1, verse 31, Listen to the forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist, John 1, 31. And I, John, knew him, Jesus Christ, not. Meaning I didn't know him in any other way, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, or that's why, am I come baptizing with water. Scripture couldn't be any clearer. John came proclaiming the baptism of repentance, a change of thinking for the remission of sins. John came in connection with the change of mind. That's what repentance means, a change of mind that God desired from the nation. That change of mind being the fact that they would not lived up to the law contract when it came to earning their righteousness by way of their adherence uh, to the law of Moses. So John's baptism with water was about the opportunity God was giving the people of Israel uh, to make their law failure confession. The law contract nation had to make a law failure confession. The confession sitting in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 through 42, if you can examine that on your own. What an opportune time for the nation to make their law failure confession in that their promised Messiah would soon be right there among them. Uh, they should have made that law failure confession. They didn't. The nation could have prepared the way for their Messiah's presence. Of course, John would proclaim the failure of the nation to accept Christ as their Messiah in John chapter 1 verse 11 where the apostle said apostle John said he came unto his own and his own received him not John looking backward at what happened the focus of Christ's earthly ministry according to everything we've just read was Israel not the nations or Gentiles but Israel alone this is why Paul said of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came so Paul the apostle of the Gentiles understood the focus of Christ's earthly ministry. And that focus had been the people with whom uh, Paul had a special kinsman connection. Uh, the Jews were Paul's people. As we said, he loved them. Listen to Paul once again 
as he spoke of Christ's earthly ministry to Israel in Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Here Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, that was Israel, for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And of course, those fathers had been no less Paul's fathers as the fathers of the nation Israel. Paul was a Jew. Do you now see why the apostle of the Gentiles always went to the Jews first? Paul knew his people. Paul loved his people. And Paul wanted his people to come to believe uh, the glorious gospel that he had come to believe. So Paul knew how zealously the Jewish leadership had been working to earn their righteousness uh, by way of their, their fleshly performance because Paul had been uh, even more zealous of the law himself. Um, not law keeping, Paul, Paul called himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's touching the law of Pharisee, strict law keeper. The Pharisees, in fact, were consider, they considered themselves to be the most stringent keepers of the law of Moses in all of Israel. They were self-proclaimed perfectionists when it uh, came to adhering to the letter of the law. Self-proclaimed is the key phrase there. And they supposed they stood righteous in the sight of Almighty God accordingly. You can understand why they, they hated Christ so adamantly. Uh, Christ was pointing to their unrighteousness. He was pointing out their failure uh, rather than to their success under the law. Christ was pointing out their failure. Now listen as Christ spoke to them in Matthew chapter 33, verse 27. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of you with this passage. Verses 27 and 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Doesn't sound happy with them, does he? For you are like whited sepulchers, uh, tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of what? Full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. He knew their, their very motivations. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Uh, why, that included Saul of Tar Tarsus in that day as well. Christ wasn't validating the Pharisees, folks. He was denouncing them. He was accusing them, uh, indicting them, incriminating them. Uh, Paul had known their mindset because Paul had, in his pharisaical days, been just like them. That is until he discovered the error of his thinking. Uh, this is why Paul was continually trying to rescue his kinsmen after the flesh uh, from the mindset that had once been his own mindset. So being able to understand Paul's Jews first direction during the course of his ministry helps us to, to better understand the task that Paul had sitting before him when it came to uh, reprogramming, in a sense. We could say reprogram reprogramming the consciences of those unbelieving Jews he was able to win over through his gospel. Paul's Jewish converts had come to believe that Christ was the Messiah that Israel had been promised and that he had, he had risen from the dead, but that, that didn't necessarily change their thinking concerning their law-keeping. They, even the ones that came to believe he was the Messiah, they still had that law keeping in their consciences. Uh, the consciences of the religious Jews who had come to believe that Christ was Israel's Messiah through Paul's ministry and that he had risen from the dead had been already programmed in uh, accordance with the law of Moses. They, they had it written in the frontlets of their minds. Uh, they knew that law forwards and backwards. They had been raised with that law. They had faithfully followed the traditions of the Jewish fathers. So their consciences were steeped in those things. After all, where had Paul found those unbelieving Jews? Where did he go in search of them? He found them in the synagogues uh, that he visited in each of the areas uh, to which he journeyed. As far, far as Paul was concerned, we know that the last thing Paul wanted to do was to injure another man's conscience. Uh, you may recall how he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that if his eating meat would embolden uh, another man to act contrary to his conscience, uh, Paul would not eat meat. He'd abstain from eating meat while the world standeth. That's a pretty long time if you think about it. Uh, so Paul did not want to offend another man's conscience. Um, rather, he wanted to strengthen that conscience and bring it into alignment with the truth of God, reprogram a conscience, and in accordance with the dispensation of, of God's grace. That would take some reprogramming for sure. Now we're going to take a, a look at Paul's four journeys, 
And we'll look at the epistles that he wrote to the people he visited during those travels uh, more closely in just a few minutes. But in those epistles, we'll see that reprogramming take place that I was talking about. But first, take a careful look at the complexion of the assemblies that Paul established during his travels. Uh, we know Paul would go into an area, and the first place he would visit was the Jewish synagogues. There he would attempt to prove to those unbelieving, uh, yet religiously minded Jews, and he would prove it from their very own scriptures that Jesus Christ is the, uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah God promised the nation, that he is the Son of God, the living God, who had uh, risen from the dead, and that God had made Christ, this Christ Lord. In other words, God had given Jesus Christ, his Son, the position of monarch, meaning supreme ruler over the earthly realm. Uh, if Paul could convince the Jews, again, uh, through their own scriptures, prophetic scriptures, of the identity of their Messiah, Jesus Christ, the one that the Jewish leaders had soundly rejected, and the place where Israel had stumbled, Paul could then teach them what Christ had accomplished for them uh, at Calvary by dying for their sins. But keep in mind, to convince these unbelieving Jews of the identity of their Messiah, the gospel of God, did not automatically cha uh, change the thinking of those religious Jews in regard to the law and the Jewish traditions of the fathers with which those Jews had been raised uh, many, many years. The law had been firmly ingrained in their minds. The law was all they had known. It was one thing to accept Christ as being Israel's promised Messiah. That that was difficult for them, but to believe that he had risen from the dead and to accept the fact that God had made him Lord, uh, that was something else altogether to convince the Jews that the law of Moses was not the way for them to uh, gain a righteous standing before God. So, in fact, after three journeys and 30-some years of ministry, Paul returned to Jerusalem once again where he visited James and the believing elders of the earthly kingdom a promise. Now, notice the discussion that took place between Paul and the elders in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 21, verses 17 through 20. First, verses 17 and 19 through 19. Uh, here, Paul said, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. What brethren would that have been, we might ask, that received Paul and his companions uh, gladly? The answer is the saints of the earthly kingdom promise. They received him gladly. He called them the brethren. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. James was the Lord's brother. Paul called him an apostle. And all the elders were present. These would have been the elders of uh, the earthly kingdom promise again. And when he, Paul, had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So now he's explaining to James what was happening in the, during the, with his ministry in the Gentiles. Did James understand the gospel that Paul had been teaching among the Gentiles? Did he understand the gospel of Christ? Of course he did. If you recall, Paul had communicated that gospel that uh, he'd been get, preaching among the Gentiles to the 12 apostles some 15 or so years earlier in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. So James knew what Paul's talking about when James when uh, James knew what Paul's talking about when Paul went to visit him. Back up those fifteen years, and listen to Paul in Galatians chapter two verse two, as he spoke of that council meeting. Here he's relaying the news of that council meeting, and I went up by revelation. In other words, the Holy Spirit told Paul to go, and I communicated unto them that gospel word of distinction, that gospel which I preached preach among the Gentiles. That gospel was the gospel of Christ, folks. But privately to them, which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain, certainly the twelve apostles of Israel knew the gospel that Paul had been teaching among the Gentiles. He told them about it. When did they learn it? Well, they learned it at the Jerusalem Council, as Paul just said. Paul just told us that he shared it with them. He shared it with them at that council. Uh, you know what Peter had to say? after hearing the gospel that Paul had been preaching among the Gentiles. Uh, and, and James agreed. Let's hear it from Peter's own lips. In Acts chapter 15, beginning with verse 8, after affirming the leg legitimacy of Paul's apostleship, 
Peter made this statement. He stood up and he said in verses 8 and 9, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them, the Gentiles, to whom Paul had been uh, preaching, witness, giving them, the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. What about the law of Moses, Peter? What part does the law of Moses play in connection with an individual salvation? Watch Peter in verses 10 and 11. He's being very honest here. Now therefore, Peter said, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, those disciples being Paul's Gentile converts, that yoke being a required obedience to the law of Moses, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. A bear meaning to carry out faithfully and consistently, as the contract called for. But we, the Jerusalem Council, uh, believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we Jews shall be saved. Now catch these last three words, even as they. So in other words, the Jews would be saved in the very same manner, the very same way that the Gentiles were being saved. And that salvation would have nothing at all to do with obedience to the law of Moses. So the law of Moses had been a yoke uh, that no Jew had been able to, to bear faithfully and consistently uh, without breaking at least one point. Peter said so. Justification unto eternal life would come by way of grace alone, through faith alone, in the gospel that the risen Lord had sent Paul to proclaim among the Gentiles the gospel of Christ once again. The very same gospel, by the way, that Paul had just communicated to the 12 at that Jerusalem council. Paul knew that the 12 apostles understood and believed the gospel, the good news that he had been sent to preach among the Gentiles. Uh, and this is why Paul went back to Jerusalem at the conclusion of his, of his three apostolic journeys in order to communicate to the brethren, as the Bible calls them, uh, meaning the Jewish believers, the Jewish saints, in connection with the earthly kingdom promise, uh, what God had been doing among the Gentiles. Uh, it was amazing to them, I believe. Let's rejoin the story of Paul's return visit in Acts chapter 21. With 30 years of ministry, three journeys now under Paul's belt, Paul having ministered to unbelieving Jews and Gentiles alike, and after writing six letters during the course of uh, those three journeys back to the people to whom he had ministered, Paul has made his return trip now to Jerusalem, as we just noted. He has saluted the elders, as we've just read a moment ago. Uh, for those watching this lesson, do you see where Paul's sitting in regard to our Acts period chart that you should be no noticing? The Jerusalem Council took place in Acts chapter 15, following Paul's first journey. But here in Acts chapter 21, in Paul's return visit to Jerusalem, the next thing on Paul's horizon is Rome and prison. He's going to be under house arrest. The elders of the earthly kingdom promise had known Paul's gospel for some 15 plus years at this point. They agreed with Paul back at the Jerusalem council as to uh, the legitimacy of his uh, apostleship. They stated that the law had been a yoke a yoke of bondage that no Jew, not even the apostles themselves, had been able to bear. Uh, they said that they understood that the Jews would be justified or saved in the same manner as the Gentiles uh, by the grace of God and not by the law of Moses. It had, been, uh, it had been 15 plus years, as I said, since that day at the Jerusalem Council when Paul made his return visit to Jerusalem. Uh, to visit James. Note, uh, verse 19, once again, let's look at it once again. Acts 21, verse 19. And when he, Paul, had saluted them, the believing saints of the earthly kingdom promise in Jerusalem, Paul declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, uh, they glorified the Lord. They, didn't, they weren't mad. They glorified the Lord and said unto Paul, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. The elders were affirming the fact that the Jewish people were zealous of law-keeping. And they were telling Paul, uh, You've witnessed how that's true. Haven't you, brother Paul? Didn't you see how they want to keep that law? Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all continuing to be zealous 
in connection with the law of Moses. So Paul had certainly witnessed that fact over the course of his previous three journeys. He had written six letters, and those letters had contained a, a whole lot about the law of Moses. Um, that's why you see Paul writing about that. You see, the apostles of Israel knew full well that a new dispensation was underway, and that it had begun with the apostle Paul the sto at the stoning, of, actually, stoning of Stephen. They knew that God had been doing a work among the Gentiles, as well as unbelieving Jews, um, through this new apostle that God had appointed to this a uh, new economy or dispensation. They had stated themselves that the law had been a yoke of bondage, as we've been saying, that no Israelite had been able uh, to keep, both faithfully and continually, which was the only way the law could be kept if righteousness was to be obtained uh, through law-keeping. They understood that it was only by the grace of God that those who uh, had been born under that law contract, the law of Moses, could possibly be saved. The Jews had to be saved in the same manner that Gentiles were being saved. They had known about and validated Paul's gospel, the gospel of Christ, back in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. Uh, so it's a, a mistaken notion to suppose that the Jews were being saved in a different manner than the Gentiles. And that's often taught in circles today. Uh, justification of eternal life would only come by way of God's grace and man's faith in the message that God was revealing. So Peter was now teaching a different thing than Paul was teaching. And we'll be proving that down the road. But it was just that Paul was revealing more than the apostles had previously understood. See, Paul's gospel was as equally good news to the uncircumcision of that day as it was to the circumcision. We've just witnessed that through Peter's words. Uh, he called the law a yoke of bondage again that no Jew had been able to keep and, and that the Jews would have to be saved in the same manner as the Gentiles. By what? By the grace of God. However, God didn't send Paul to preach his gospel to the saints of the circumcision who had already become believers in the gospel of God through Peter's ministry. He'd be, he'd be laying his new news on people who had already begun and believed under Peter and the 12, or the 11. It would be the responsibility of Peter and the 11 to update the circumcision as to the grand news that Paul had received and had been preaching outside of Jerusalem. Even though God had ceased dealing with Israel on a national basis, that did not mean that God had ceased reaching out to individual Jewish people with the identity of their Messiah and that he had risen from the dead, along with the glorious news of what their Messiah had accomplished for them, uh, where their sins were concerned when he died for their sins at Calvary. Um, because Christ became sin on their behalf at Calvary. Paul revealed the gospel of Christ to the twelve. That gospel which Paul preached, he re revealed that gospel to the twelve at the Jerusalem Council, as we've already seen. And the author of the letter to the Hebrews had written about it to the Jews of the Diaspora, Jews who had already believed the gospel of God and fled because of the persecution that arose about Stephen. So they were updated. They were already believers. They're already in the household of faith. Now they're being updated with this further information from Paul. Isn't any question uh, that the 12 apostles knew Paul's gospel and that they had believed it when Paul revealed it to them. But, but we need to keep in mind that the consciences of Jewish people who had been born under the law of Moses had been programmed uh, according to that law. Uh, who would tell them to cease obeying the law? Certainly not the Apostle Paul. He obeyed the law himself. However, Paul would tell them that if they were trying to obey the law in order to earn their righteous standing with God by way of their performance, uh, they'd be obligated to keep the entire law, Paul said, and keep it in its entirety all of the time. And that that would not only be an effort in futility, <laughs> There should be no way they could do it. To use the law in order to acquire righteousness before God was to move in a direction opposite, <coughs> pardon me, opposite the message Paul was teaching about God's grace. <coughs> and the only righteousness that God can recognize, righteousness that is freely credited to the believer's account by way of that believer being joined to Christ. Uh, notice here, the Apostle Paul had a major reconstruction project before him as he began each of his apostolic journeys. He not only had to preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, 
to unbelieving Jews and Gentiles alike, he had to reprogram the consciences of the Jews who went ahead and believed his message, but still felt obligated to keep the law of Moses for, uh, for righteousness sake. Um, these new believing Jews, they were babies, would have been in the same assemblies as the Gentile converts Paul won through his gospel. Uh, kind of a mixed bag there. This is why the six epistles Paul wrote during his four journeys contain information concerning the law. We need to understand that Paul is not bringing the law into the economy or the dispensation of the grace of God in any of his letters. In other words, he was not saying, welcome to grace. Now, here are the rules. <laughs> he was, instead, he, he was not saying, welcome to grace, here are the rules. He was merely explaining the law to those Jews in his assemblies whose consciences had been programmed by the law because they'd been born under that law. This will become much more clear as we begin to retrace Paul's four journeys and his letters in connection with those journeys. Uh, follow along, and I believe the picture will begin to clear up in a sense as we, as we move forward. This will take more than a single lesson, so I don't expect to, to get it all in one sitting, but hopefully you're going to see why Paul baptized the few that he did baptize, and you're going to see uh, why miracles were still, being occur were still occurring as Paul began ministering, and why the gifts of, of prophecy and speaking in tongues, languages they didn't have to learn, were still in operation during the time of Paul's journeys. We'll also see why Paul talked about uh, the Lord's table when writing to the Corinthians and why he talked about uh, prayer uh, when writing his epistle um, to the Romans. All those things that are questions will be cleared up. Just understand that a new dispensation was indeed in place at the point of Paul's uh, conversion and that Paul was not offering the Jews another 35 or so years in order to get their promised earthly kingdom. Understanding what's happening in the book of Acts and why it's happening, where it's happening, in connection with Paul's ministry could help. It could help clear up a vast amount of confusion that exists in the realm of uh, Christendom so-called today. Let's begin with Paul's first journey go as far as we can here. His journey to Asia Minor, Acts chapters 13 and 14, speak to this trip. Uh, this journey took place 10 years after Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. So the dispensation of the grace of God had been fully underway for 10 years when the Holy Spirit made it known to the church at Antioch, uh, Antioch, Syria that is, that they should send Paul and Barnabas on their first evangelistic excursion into Asia Minor. It's on the left-hand side of your chart there. Um, as you can see on our map entitled Paul's First Journey, Paul and Barnabas set sail to Cyprus where they encountered John Mark who accompanied them to Paphos and then up to Perga which is now southern Turkey uh, in Asia Minor. John Mark, also known as Marcus, returned to Jerusalem at that point and Paul and Barnabas proceeded uh, to go on up to Antioch, Pisidia. As would be Paul's custom on each of his journeys, the first place he would visit was the Jewish synagogue. Uh, so Paul was going to his kinsmen after the flesh, those he loved, namely the Jews first. Paul made some Jewish converts in Antioch, Syria. But as was always the case, the vast majority of the Jews in that area uh, were outraged at Paul's teachings. Uh, so on this first journey to Asia, uh, to Asia Minor, that is, Paul ceased targeting his kinsmen after the flesh. And he directed his message at that point to the Gentiles in that area who were much more open to what Paul had to say. In fact, they were quite anxious to give Paul an audience. Listen to Paul in Acts chapter 13, verse 36, as he turned away from the Jews in Asia Minor, directing his efforts in that area instead toward the Gentiles of that region. Listen to Paul, Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, you religiously minded Jews, that is. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You see, Paul didn't wait to turn to the Gentiles until the third time he would make such a remark he turned to the Gentiles right there in Galatia after the Jews in that region were stirred up against him, as the Bible says. But what about 
the Jewish people who did believe Paul's message. And, and what about the Gentiles in that area that became believers as well? Uh, they would have both been a part of an assembly of believers in that area, uh, perhaps more than one assembly of believers. So you can see how there were former Jewish zealots, where the law was concerned, uh, who became converts to Paul's gospel, and former unbelieving Gentiles who had never been under the law of Moses, uh, meeting together in the same assembly, or assemblies, many in that area. Uh, so when you're reading these first six epistles of Paul, as listed on our Acts period diagram, read these epistles in light of the impact Paul intended they make on the Jewish contingency within those assemblies uh, of the areas that Paul visited because uh, there were formerly devoutly religious Jews in those assemblies, uh, Jews whose consciences had been programmed formerly with the law of Moses in mind, right along with Gentiles who had never been placed under the law of Moses in the first place. Uh, so it's a mixed bag of people here. Having believed Paul's message, uh, those two groups found themselves sitting together, in a manner of speaking, in the same grace dispensation assemblies of believers founded by Paul. Or as was the, the case with Romans and Colossians, assemblies founded by someone other than Paul who had come to believe Paul's message. Uh, Paul didn't have to uh, worry about the consciences of the Gentiles, at least not in the same respect that uh, he had to consider the consciences, consciences of the Jews. Paul would be the one to shape the consciences of the Gentiles. However, he did have to think about the consciences of the Jewish zealots, former Jewish zealots. Consciences he would have to reshape, uh, realign by way of letter. Uh, as you read these first six epistles, you'll see how Paul was working to reshape, to reprogram the consciences of those zealous of the law, Jewish, now Jewish believers. So after Paul retraced his steps, uh, returned to Antioch, Syria, it's my belief that he wrote the epistle to the Galatians. That would have been his first epistle. I believe he wrote this epistle first because of the wording of the letter itself. Listen to his words at the opening of his letter in chapter 1, verse 6, uh, the Galatians, a letter, the letter to Galatia, verses 6 and 7. I marvel that ye are, catch this, so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So jump ahead to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 for just a moment. What did Paul call them? O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Um, you see, Paul had taught them about Christ's death on their behalf at Calvary. These folks would have been aware of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, as Paul called it. Uh, they had heard Paul. Uh, they would have heard the gospel of Christ because that's where Paul would have taken them. They had, uh, they had begun with Paul's gospel, Paul tells us. The problem in Galatia was not that these folks were falling back into sin. I'm sure that sin was just as uh, prevalent in Galatia as it is wherever you live. <laughs> uh, whether you're here in uh, where we're teaching, North Carolina, or whether you're listening in another, from another location, the truth is we all sin. That wasn't the issue in Galatia. It wasn't they were falling back into sin. Rather than falling back into sin, these folks, at least a certain group within that assembly or that fellowship, were falling back into law. What group within that fellowship would have been predisposed to that error of falling back into law? Why, sure, those who were formerly zealous of the law, the Jews that Paul had won over from uh, the synagogue that he visited when he first uh, entered Antioch. Uh, Pisidia. You see, they would have known the law like Paul had known the law. Listen to Paul speak of himself as he writes back to the Galatian assembly in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. There Paul said, For ye have heard of my conversation 
in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the, the church of God and wasted it. The church of God, only one church of God, that church at that point in time was those uh, Jewish believers uh, in Christ as Messiah and wasted it and profited above, above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. What had happened in Galatia that had caused the folks there, especially those who could relate firsthand to what Paul just said about being exceedingly zealous of the traditions of the Jewish fathers, uh, to want to slide back to a behavioral basis by which to uh, assess their standing before God. Why did they want their behavior as part of it? Well, the problem was coming from some other Jewish men who had come to Galatia from Judea in order to spy out the liberty that Paul's gospel brought the Galatians. Uh, Paul reveals the problem in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Well, here it is. And certain men, certain Jewish men, <clears throat> which came down from Judea, taught the brethren in Galatia and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. What a thing to tell them. This was the issue at Galatia. The same issue that led to the appearance of Paul and Barnabas before the Jerusalem council. Why would the previous law-loving Jews who had been won over by Paul's gospel and who had become a part of the Galatian assembly why would they be predisposed to believe that those who had come from Judea, um, that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved? Well, what had the original covenant between God and Abram said uh, concerning the right of circumcision? Let's read it from Genesis chapter 17, uh, beginning with verse 10. There, this is my covenant which ye shall keep, God told them, between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. Not could be, should be, possibly, but give it a chance. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Uh, continuing on there in verse, chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, for an everlasting covenant. This was a pretty strict requirement for all Jewish males. Um, what would be the consequence of a Jewish person who resisted this covenant requirement. Well, here it is in the very next verse. Notice it with me, verse 14. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. If you were a male and you wanted to be considered a part of the Jewish nation, or if you wanted your male children to be considered a part of the people of God, the Jewish nation, you had to comply with this Jewish requirement. It wasn't a maybe so or maybe no type of arrangement. It was an absolute must. Uh, you now see why uh, or how easy it would have been for those who had been zealous of the law and the traditions of the fathers, the Jewish fathers, uh, their consciences having been programmed, pre-programmed accordingly, who had become believers now of Paul's gospel and a part of the Galatian assembly um, to be predisposed to take the men who had come from Judea at their word. Apparently, even the Gentile believers of that assembly uh, were beginning to, to lean toward the necessity of circumcision for salvation. Circumcision was being taught by these intruders as a necessity to complete one's faith. In other words, faith wasn't complete unless you did something to complete it. You had to add to something to it to complete it. How about the circumcision requirement? Why had circumcision ceased to be an issue where the Jewish believers of Paul's day were concerned? It ceased to be an issue for two reasons. First of all, God was no longer dealing with Israel as a nation, and the covenant of circumcision 
had been a national issue. Secondly, and even more importantly, uh, was the fact that the, the ascended Christ had revealed to Paul uh, the reality of a different uh, type of circumcision. A spiritual circumcision, a circumcision made without hands, Paul called it, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision or cutting off of Christ, his death. It was a spiritual circumcision that God was now recognizing, not a circumcision made with hands. So how did Paul react to the teaching of these Israelite legalistic intruders who were teaching necessity of circumcision uh, for salvation. Well, let's allow Paul re our remaining minutes to answer it for us. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, he does that very thing. In verses 3 and 4, Paul states, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares, uh, brought in, who, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, that they might bring us into bondage, that law again. So when it was a matter of, of uh, doctrine, they refused it. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now some have asked why Paul, on his second journey, circumcised Timothy after refusing to give ground when it came to Titus and Galatia. After all, Paul was in the very same region, Galatia, on his second journey when he circumcised Timothy. Why would he remain adamantly defiant in one instance and not in the other? Well, let's take a, a quick look at that account as it appears in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 and 2 state, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. That's Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess. And believed, but his father was a Greek, uh, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Now watch what occurs in verse 3. Him, Timothy that is, would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father, they all knew that his father was a Greek. Timothy's mother was Jewish. His father was not. And Paul wanted to reach the Jews of that area with his gospel. The difference is this. The false brethren who came in to spy out the liberty of the Galatian assembly were making circumcision an issue for salvation. And in doing so, they were teaching in direct opposition to Paul's message of salvation by grace, by grace alone, through faith alone, and the uh, sin-resolving accomplishment of, of Christ's cross work alone. So when circumcision was being used as an issue for salvation, Paul wouldn't give ground for a second. He wouldn't give ground for a moment as he, he testified. Paul stood his ground because they were making it a salvation issue. However, on his second journey to that same region, and in his attempt to win the unbelieving Jews, once again in that area, he didn't want to offend the consciences of those who had yet to hear his teachings. By not offending their consciences uh, right from the get-go, they might pay heed to what he had to tell them about Jesus Christ. So when it was a doctrinal issue, circumcision was a no-go for Paul. <laughs> when it was a conscience issue only, not something being taught in a purposeful uh, opposition to Paul's gospel, Paul did that which was necessary in order to gain the, the audience uh, of the unbelieving Jews. Uh, you see the, the difference there? On that first journey, uh, the Jews that were a part of the assembly of Galatia had heard Paul's gospel. They had known it. They had believed Paul's gospel. And then false doctrine was being introduced in order to, to lead them to believe a false gospel, to move away from grace into law. Uh, you can see how the Jews in that assembly would have been particularly predisposed in the first place to stray from the truth that Paul taught them. So Paul's letter helped to redirect, actually to reprogram the consciences of those formerly Pharisaical Jews who had come to faith through, through Paul's message, through his preaching. This is why Paul 
reminded them in his Galatian epistle of that which he had taught them and what had led to their belief in the first place. Watch Paul very quickly embolden their consciences in the truth uh, of his gospel in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. He's, he's reprogramming the conscience here. Knowing the man is not, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of or belonging to Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith belonging to Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall how many? No flesh be justified. Uh, so watch as Paul continues the reprogramming of the Jewish consciences that I've been talking about here in Galatians. Uh, chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, Paul said, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? <laughs> Uh, what had James told the Jews? James had spoken truth uh, concerning the law of Moses when he said in James chapter 2 verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Uh, the good news, Paul was reminding those in Galatia that had formerly been like Paul, Pharisaical Jews, sits in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21. And Galatians chapter 3, for that matter, verse 13. Let's read both those passages very quickly, uh, keeping in mind the impact that God wanted his words to have on the consciences of the Jewish group within the Galatian assembly. Uh, so it's directed really toward them. I do not frustrate the grace of God, Paul said, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Uh, just whoever gets the best score wins. <laughs> Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse in our place. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Uh, we might as well add, add Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, where Paul gives them direct exhortation along with a condition. Here Paul said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, for your righteous standing before God is the idea here, Christ shall profit you nothing. You're trying to gain your, your righteousness by your performance. So once again, to recap, the problem in Galatia was a predisposition of the Jewish believers within that assembly to slip back into law-keeping for their righteous standing before God. And of course, the, the Gentiles in that, in that assembly would have been led to follow suit. So while Paul's letter was equally true for the Gentile believers of that assembly, it was meant to have a special impact on the consciences of the Jews within that group. I hope you see that. Circumcision was in no way attached to their righteous standing before God, whether they supposed it to be so or not. As we've just seen from the Apostle Paul, a pinch of Sinai is just as deadly when it comes to a person's righteousness before God as a bucket full or a truckload of Sinai. A pinch is all it takes. Believers today need to heed Paul's teachings in the letter to the Galatians equally as much as the believers of Galatia in Paul's day. It's sad uh, to me that a lot of folks want to be justified by faith today. But then they slip back into the notion that God's dealing with them on a daily basis by way of their performance. You know what I'm talking about. This is precisely why the Jewish believers within the Galatian assembly needed to have their consciences reprogrammed. Um, we've go we're going to, to see that same, uh, the same thing will be true when it comes to the letter Paul will write while on his second journey. As you can see on our Acts period diagram once again, Paul wrote the letters to the saints in Thessalonica while on his second journey. Uh, he wrote those letters from Corinth, by the way, where he remained for a total of 18 months, by the way, teaching them. What impact was Paul trying to make on the Jewish believers within this Thessalonian assembly? I might ask, I might ask it this way. For those who had known the law and the prophets, what did those Jewish folks in Thessalonica, Thessaloniki as it's called today, have to learn about the new dispensation that had been ushered in through Paul? What did they need to know? For the answer, 
you have to join us for our next study as we, uh, as we begin to follow Paul on his second venture into Asia Minor, followed by what has been called the Macedonian call, as Paul is going to go further on this journey than he did on his first journey. You can see the area on our the four journeys of Paul map that, uh, that illustrates Paul's journey number two. Some interesting things lie ahead where uh, the catching up of the household of faith is concerned. Uh, Bible scholars have given it the name the rapture. Even though it doesn't appear in the Bible, the wording the rapture is talking about the catching up of the saints. We'll learn more about that as we follow Paul's next evangelical adventure. To see what those things are about, join our next study as we continue to journey through the Bible. Uh, thanks for joining us today in our lesson and stay tuned for our next lesson as we continue.